Oh yes, our stasis. Every beekeeper should know that story. She smiled at me in a way that made me feel I was about to get part two of the beekeeper's induction, part one being the sting. Our stasis was the first beekeeper of bees. One day, all his bees died, punishment by the gods for something that our stasis had done. The gods told him to sacrifice a bull to show he was sorry, and then return to the carcass nine days and look inside. Well, our stasis did just what they said, and when he came back, he saw a swarm of bees fly out of the dead bull, his own bees reborn. He took them home to his hives, and after that, people believed that bees had power over death. The kings in Greece made their tombs in the shape of beehives for that very reason. Zack sat with his elbows on his knees, staring at the circle of grass, still flat and emerald green from our dance in the sprinkler. When a bee flies, a soul will rise, he said. I gave him a blank look. It's an old saying. August said. It means a person's soul will be reborn into the next life if bees are around. Is that in the Bible? I, I said. August laughed. No, but back when the Christians hid from the Romans down in the catacombs, they used to scratch pictures of bees on the walls to remind each other that when they died, they'd be resurrected. I shoved my hands under my thighs and sat up trying to picture catacombs, whatever they were. Do you think putting black cloths over the hives will help May go to heaven? I asked. Goodness, no, August said. Putting black cloths on the hives is for us. I do it to remind us that life gives way to death, and then death turns around and gives way to life. I leaned back in my chair, gazing at the sky. How endless it was, the way it fit down over the world like the lid of a hive. I wished more than anything we could bury May in a beehive tomb that I could, myself, lie down in one and be reborn. When the daughters of Mary showed up, they were loaded down with food. The last time I'd seen them, Queenie and her daughter Violet had on the smallest hats in the group, and this time they'd left them off completely. I think it was because Queenie hated to cover the whiteness of her hair, which she was proud to have, and Violet, who had to be 40 at least, couldn't bring herself to wear a hat if her mother wasn't wearing one. If Queenie went into the kitchen and stuck her head in the oven, Violet would go stick hers in too. Lunel, Maybelline, Cressy, and Sugar Girl which wore a bl each wore a black hat, not as spectacular as the previous ones, except for Lunel's, which had both a red veil and red feathers. They took off the hats and lined them up on the piano as soon as they came in, so that you wanted to say, what's the use? They got under the slice, they got underway slicing ham, laying out fried chicken, shaking paprika on the deviled eggs. We had green beans, turnips, macaroni and cheese, caramel cake, all kinds of funeral foods. We ate standing in the kitchen holding paper plates, saying how much May would have liked everything. When we were so full that what we needed was a nap, we went to the parlor and sat with May. The daughters passed around a wooden bowl full of something they called mana, a salted mixture of sunflower, sesame, pumpkin, and pomegranate seeds drizzled with honey and baked to perfection. They ate it by the handfuls, saying they wouldn't dream of sitting with the dead without eating seeds. Seeds kept the living from despair, they explained. Maybelline said, she looks so good. Doesn't she look good? Queenie snorted. If she looks that good, maybe we ought to put her on display in, the drive, in a drive-by window at a funeral home. Oh, Queenie, cried Maybelline. Cressy noticed Rosalina and me sitting there in the dark and said, the funeral home in town was a drive-by window. It used to be a bank. Nowadays, they put the open casket right up in the window where you used to be able to drive through and get your checks cashed said Queenie. People can drive through and pay their respects without having to get out. They even send the guest book out in the drawer for you to sign. You ain't serious, said Rosaline. Oh yeah, Queenie said. We're serious. They might have been speaking the truth, but they didn't look serious. They were falling on each other laughing, and there was May, dead. Lunell said, I drove in there one time to see Mrs. Lamar after she passed since I used to work for her way back when. The woman who sat in the window beside her casket used to be the bank teller there, and when I drove off, she said, you have a nice day now. 
I turned to August, who was wiping her eyes from tears of hilarity. I said, you won't let them put May in the bank window, will you? Honey, don't worry about it, said Sugar Girl. The drive-by window is at the white people's funeral home. They're the only ones with enough money to fix up something that ridiculous. They all broke down again with hysterics, and I could not help but laugh too, partially with relief that people would not be joy-riding through the funeral home to see May, and partially because you could not help laughing at the sight of the daughters laughing. But I will tell you this secret thing, which not one of them saw, not even August, the thing that brought me the most cause for gladness. It was how Sugar Girl said what she did, like I was truly one of them. Not one person in the room said, Sugar Girl, really? Talking about white people like that? We have a white person present. They didn't even think of me being different. Up until then, I'd thought that white people and colored people getting along was the big aim. But after that, I decided everybody being colorless together was a better plan. I thought of the policeman, Eddie Hazelwurst, saying I'd lowered myself to be in this house of colored women, and for the very life of me, I couldn't understand how it had turned out this way, how colored women had become the lowest ones on the totem pole. You only had to look at them to see how special they were, like hidden royalty among us. Eddie Hazelwurst, what a shit bucket. I felt so warm inside toward them, I thought to myself that if I could die, if I should die, I would be glad to go on display in the bank window and give the Daughters of Mary a good laugh. On the second morning of the vigil, long before the Daughters arrived, even before June came downstairs, August found May's suicide note, caught beneath the roots of a live oak not ten yards from the spot she died. The woods had buried it under fresh sprouted leaves, the kind that shoot up overnight. Rosaline was making banana cream pie in honor of May, and I was sitting at the table working on my cereal and trying to find something de decent on the transistor radio when August burst into the kitchen holding the note with two hands, like the world might fall off if she wasn't real careful. She yelled up the stairs, June, come down here. I found a note from May. August spread it out on the table and stood over it with her hands pressed together.